Yeah, well, so I'm, I'm a Twitter person. I use Twitter a lot. Um, and Twitter can be really good, but it can also be really, really bad. I think Twitter's great. I, I actually got a part-time job during, um, during lockdown because uh, the connections I made on Twitter, I actually meet people in person that I've met on Twitter. I think it's really, really good. But I saw something advertised on Twitter recently, um, and I thought it was really, really bad. Uh, and it kind of prompted this, this 15 minute preach. I'll try and keep it to 15 minutes. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, but what I saw on Twitter really troubled me. Um, but I'm going to reveal what I saw on Twitter like, at the end, because I want you to kind of understand why it really troubled me. And uh, so I want to give you a bit of context first. So today, I'm going to talk about idols. I'm going to talk about pagan gods. And I'm going to talk about demons, because they're all kind of the same thing, actually. Um, and I'm going to talk about them interchangeably. I'm not going to kind of get into the scripture systematically today. I don't have time. Uh, but if you look at the first letters of the Corinthians, uh, that's a great Bible book to read about how demons and idols and pagan gods are all kind of the same thing and um, kind of how we're, uh, and kind of what we're allowed to do and kind of what's beneficial and kind of the message that it sends out. So take a look at first Corinthians. Um, but the parable I'm going to be covering today is a parable about demons. And we've recently, as a congregation, we've been kind of bringing out this message about how we're in a battle. Um, God's been speaking through people uh, like Jane Woodall, Marianne Nell, uh, Gareth Cunliffe, uh, kind of talking about how this church family is in a battle against demons. And so I hope to bring some practicality to that and some clarity to that message. So, uh, but first, I have a Hindu parable for you. A story from Hindu religion uh, about Shiva the destroyer, he's the blue guy, cool name, um, and his wife Parvati, who's like the Hindu mother goddess, and their two kids, Ganesh and Kartikeya, are sat there on their laps. Um, Ganesh is the one with the elephant head, and Kartikeya, he likes to ride on a very fast peacock. That's his peacock that he rides on down there at the bottom. So here's the story. One day, Shiva and Parvati come by a special mango of wisdom. And the two boys both want this wisdom mango. And so uh, Parvati comes up with like a competition because uh, she's got two little boys, right? So she wants to kind of keep them occupied for a bit. So she says, uh, whichever one of you can go all the way around the world three times gets the wisdom mango. And that should keep them busy for a bit. So... Kartikeya, he hops on his peacock, and he travels all the way around the world three times, and he visits all the Hindu sites. And, um, but Ganesh, he's like a pudgy, pudgy little elephant boy, um, he sits there and he, he, he says, I haven't, got a, I haven't got a peacock to ride on. He actually rides on a little mouse. Can you see the little mouse in the, in the picture? That's, his, that's what he rides on. Um, he's like an elephant, and he rides on a mouse. It's hilarious. But um, here's what he does. He goes up to his parents, Shiva and uh, Parvati, and he goes around them three times on his little mouse. And he goes, Mummy, Daddy, you are the world to me. Um, so he gets the mango. He gets the wisdom mango. Um, so here's, here's, my, here's my pudgy little boy, Joshua. I love him so much, guys. <laughs> um, but unlike Ganesh, firstly, and most importantly, he doesn't have an elephant's head. And, um, and secondly, I would never tell him he's wise for thinking that me and his mum are the whole world. I wouldn't give him a wisdom mango. If he pulled that with me, I'd have sent him around the world six times on that little mouse just for saying something so stupid. He's, <laughs> he's, he's not my whole world. and I, I would hate to think that he would say that I'm his whole world. That's not wisdom. Because so this speaks to a certain kind of idolatry that we talk about these days when we're talking about idols. Um, the, the idea of idolizing someone or something. Um, in recent preachers we've had, so Aaron, Aaron spoke recently about making money or wealth, mammon, making that into an idol. Um, he said, you know, he was talking about 
where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Like the things that you value will determine your desires, the things you work for. And uh, Tom in, in Tom CV, what is he done? He's probably out the back. Um, he was talking about how uh, in the series of, in the Ezra and Nehemiah series he went through recently, which is a great series, by the way. Go back on YouTube, watch the whole series again. It was really, really good. Um, he was telling us about how we can put ourselves at the center instead of God. Uh, he was talking about the ends of worship and how uh, the whole of creation is, is worshiping God. And that's the purpose, the ends of creation. Um, but sometimes we give more attention to our own ideas. And then in this Hindu parable, Ganesh idolizes his parents. Um, they're his whole world. Nothing else in the whole world matters, just, just his parents. And everything bigger than that is disregarded. But if we put all of our attention on wealth, on self, on family, and turn these things into the only things that matter in the world, where are you going to go when they let you down? Uh, who are you going to appeal to? I want Josh to understand that I'm not going to get everything right, and neither is he. Um, and there's a higher mission I can call him to rather than just to worship me and his mum. I'm not the perfect father, and Ali's not the perfect mother. I mean, she's great. She's really good. But, like, um, but she's not like Parvati from the, from the Hindu religion, who's like the, this perfect mother goddess, you know. And, um, you know, and this, this image is supposed to represent the kind of perfect, perfect family, perfect transcendent family. Um, and I think families, in reality, are much less like these Hindu gods. They're more like the Greek gods. We've got, uh, in Greek myth, Gaia is like the, the Mother Earth character. She's the one lying down there. And, um, and she has 18 children with Uranus, the sky god, who's the guy standing up. He's got the signs of the zodiac all around him. And, um, and all of these kids, all 18 of them, were, they were all monsters. The, the, you've got the 12 titans and then the cyclopses who have one eye and the hecaton kairis who have 100 hands each. Um, and, and Uranus hates these kids. He hates his kids because they're monsters. Um, so one day, Gaia goes and tells her monster kids to go and sort out Uranus. And uh, they're all too scared. Um, but apart from one of them, apart from Cronos, uh, who's one of the titans, and he's like the god of time. And he castrates uh, Uranus. And he takes his place as the sort of ruler of the universe. And... Uh, Gaia, his mother, is very happy with, with Kronos as the ruler of the universe. But then Kronos has kids as well with one of his sisters. And uh, so Gaia warns him about his kids taking over. And so Kronos eats all of his babies. He eats them. Um, but then he gets tricked. And instead of eating Zeus, his son, uh, he eats a stone. And then Zeus grows up in secret and comes back and gets him to throw up all of the babies. Uh, they're, and they're all grown up now. They've been growing up inside him. And, um, and then, yeah, and then they become the Olympian gods. And there's a big war between the, the Kronos and the Titans and Zeus and the Olympians. And uh, Zeus basically wins this whole battle because he's got lightning. He's like, he's, he's bringing the light. So he's got lightning bolts and he can win the battle. And yeah, that sounds like a bit of a weird story. Um, but it's kind of saying... Zeus is like bringing the light, and so he has power over heaven, Uranus, in the sky. He has power over uh, time, Kronos, and he has power over the earth, Gaia, is what it's trying to say. But we all know that's lies. It's lies. It's all lies. Uh, um, because we know that the God of the Bible is the most high God, above heaven even. Um, and by the power of, ho of his Holy Spirit, he he comes and he fills up all of heaven, and he fills up all of time, and he fills up the entire earth. Um, and his son Jesus Christ is the true light of the world. Zeus is just pretending. Uh, but Zeus. Zeus was worshipped as the kind of main god, god of the universe. And here's a proper idol, right? This is this is this is this isn't just idolizing a concept like money or or family. This is literally an idol to a pagan god. Uh, this is the this is an image of the uh, the temple of Zeus in Olympia. Um, this is an idol of Zeus. The statue is kind of made from dead materials, like wood and stone. And 
uh, and, they, and they can't help you in any real way. They can't speak to you or help you. Um, but worshippers would call the sculpture by the spirit's name and kind of meet the spirit of Zeus in the statue. And they would worship these spirits in these temples. And I'm kind of saying spirit now instead of God because we don't worship these lying spirits. They're not our gods. They're not our spirits. And we can know that these spirits aren't our spirits because they accept worship instead of pointing to anything higher. And when spirits direct us away from the highest God and towards themselves, we call these spirits demons. Demons say, come and look at me. Ignore anything else above me or around me. On the other hand, heavenly spirits bring God's message to us. That's why they're called messengers. That's what that word angel means. It means messenger of God. They say, don't worship me. Look up. Look up to God in the highest. So what's my point? We need to get the idols out of the temple. Cast the demons out of the body. We need to get these evil spirits out of our lives so that instead of focusing too much on them, we focus on our Father God in the highest heaven instead. It's all, it's all the same thing. And this is the spiritual battle we are in. It's a battle for attention. Uh, does anyone know who this guy is? You know? Jordan Peterson. Jordan B. Peterson. He's a, like a Canadian professor and a psychologist. And he's kind of an internet celebrity. If you're uh, like a man, if you're an Instagrammy person, there are a couple of Instagrammy people here, you've probably seen some clips of his advice online. Um, and he says a lot of good things. He says some not so good things. But here's one of the things he says. He says, clean your room. And he's got like a sort of voice a bit like Kermit the Frog. It's like, clean, clean your room. I can't do it. Um, but this is, this is what he says. He says, imagine you're dealing with someone who's hoarding. You walk into the house and there's like 10,000 things in their house. There's maybe 100 boxes and you open up a box and in the box are some pens, and some old passports, some checks, some dust, a dead mouse. Sorry, Ganesh. And there's boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff like that in the house. And it's absolute chaos in there. And you think, is that their house or is that their being? And the answer is there's no difference. If you want to organize your psyche, you could start by organizing your room, if that would be easier, because maybe you're a more concrete person. You need something concrete to do. Look around for something that bothers you. See if you can fix it. So we need to clean up the place. Chuck out all the rubbish. Uh, here's, here's an example. It's a great example from Nehemiah 13, which Andy highlighted in his preach. Uh, he was rounding out the whole Ezra and Nehemiah series. And Andy was speaking about how Tobiah, the Ammonite, uh, had weaseled his way into the temple. An enemy of Judea was living right in the temple. And the people of God had abandoned the Sabbath to trade. Uh, and the space that Tobiah was using as a warehouse was the space that they used to have uh, all of the stuff that they used to worship God in that space. And this is what Nehemiah did, Nehemiah did starting verse 7. Uh, uh, and I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the court of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all of the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers and brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. Cleaning the house of God. Casting out evil. This is what the battle looks like for us too. When those demons and idols start to sit in the place where God should be sat, we need to get angry and cast them out. But that's not the whole story. So... <laughs> Finally, with all that context, uh, we're ready for the parable of the empty house, uh, a parable about demons from chapter 12 of Matthew's gospel. I'm going to start by reading verse 22 to 28, and then we'll get to the parable a bit further down in verse 43. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him, says Jesus, so that the man spoke and saw. 
And the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David, meaning the Messiah? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this guy casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will this kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom will your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In the parable. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, put in order. And then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also it will be with this evil generation. Christianity is not just about getting rid of sin and demons. I'm not saying that's not important, but there's more. The, the Christian reality is about so much more than just salvation from sin. Sanctification, purification, justification, casting out demons, all of that is important. But that's only the beginning and the kind of surface level of the transformation that happens for a Christian. We'll be having a baptism service next week, and the water in that that baptizing in water represents that cleansing power. So I'm not trying to trivialize any of that stuff by any means. Um, but that's just the beginning of a Christian life. If we only focus on getting rid of those demons, we forget about where our attention is meant to be. And something else weasels its way into the house of God. You're worse off than when you started. Money, self, family if not dedicated to the right spirit, it all becomes clean space that demons can enter into. But also just random nonsense we find on the internet can enter in as well, like the opinions and sayings of people that you don't even know if they're Christian or not. And you know, stuff on social media battles for your attention. It causes you to lose the ability to discern what is true and what is beneficial or see what kind of message you're sending out to the world. Because you're stuck looking at this thing that says, forget about anything higher than, than me. Look at me. Do you want to know what I saw on Twitter that disturbed me so much? Uh, there's an art exhibit that's going up in Derby Cathedral at the end of September. It's a huge floating sculpture of Earth. Uh, seven meters in diameter and it's got sort of satellite photos of Earth all kind of stuck to a big helium balloon, so it kind of floats, and it looks kind of cool. But guess what name they gave it? Gaia. That's the advert. And it's not just in Derby Cathedral. It's doing a tour. St. Paul's Cathedral, Southwark Cathedral, Chelmsford Cathedral, Rochester Cathedral, Gloucester Cathedral, Ely Cathedral, Gaia. In the house of God. It's like, a, it's like a big, it's a balloon. It's a massive balloon called Gaia. The way we cast out demons isn't just by cleaning our rooms. We're not just trying to be good people here uh, and kind of detaching from the things that we idolize. When we leave it there, we end up letting bigger demons in. We have to actively battle to put our attention in the right place or something will take up that space and we'll be worse off. Instead of just putting things in order, we cast out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice what Nehemiah did just after kicking out Tobiah. He says, Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. They brought back the things they used to worship and welcome in the Holy Spirit of God. Notice how Jesus casts out demons, not by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons, but by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. 
by filling this house with the Spirit of God, we push everything else out. How do we do this practically? The same way the angels do. By pointing to God with everything that we do so that our entire lives are a message proclaiming the glory of God. So, as a reflection, I would like us to spend some time praying around these specific questions so that we can be sure these kind of common areas of our lives are filled with the Holy Spirit instead of that space being taken up by demons. How can I love my family in a way that points them to God? How can I use money in a way that glorifies God? How can I use my own ideas to shift people's attention towards God? And how can, how can I be using the time that I spend on the internet to honor God? This is a battle we can all fight. This is a mission we can all join in on. I'm going to pray and then leave some silence for us to reflect on these questions. Father God, remind us of your presence here with us so that we may keep our eyes fixed on you. Fill us with your spirit so that our lives may be a reflection of your holiness. Help us in this battle to cast out demons and idols and pagan gods by allowing you to fill up every part of our lives with your spirit. And in the name of your precious son, Jesus Christ, help us to be messengers of your word, carrying your name for all the world to see. Amen.